I was about 14. And we were paired against a Marine sergeant and a 19-year-old man. So, I mean, he was a young man, but he, he, was, he was a man. And I was like, okay. Well, I ain't scared. Let's go. You know, I was too dumb to know any difference. And uh, so here I go. I climb up on my dad's back, and I lock my legs in behind his back. And he locked his arms around my legs. And I said, hmm, you know, those old arms are, you know, they, uh, they were hardened by hauling hay and milking cows. And maybe that old man still got it in him. Let's find out. So uh, here we go. You know, we start wading across the, in that water. We start getting closer and closer. You know, my heart starts beating like, you know, I'm just, oh, goodness, here we are. We're about to get in a fight, you know. And uh, I'm starting to sweat. And uh, we get right up on them, and, man, we start going at it. I mean, we're just going, and, you know, of course, we're wet, so we're slippery, and we're sliding everywhere. And, you know, and I'm just trying to get a hold. I can't quite get a hold, and we're just back and forth, back and forth, each shifting of weight, you know, our anchor men are, they're slipping and they're trying to fall, stay, stay on top, and I finally get a hold, and I'm like, I got them, and I just wrench really hard, splash, we went into the water, and I'm lying there, face down, defeated, and I realize, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure I at least got them to come with us. So maybe we just tied. And about that time, I realized that my legs are still wrapped around my dad's back. And my dad still has a hold of my legs. And with what seemed like impossible force, I rose from the water. And I surveyed the faces of the shocked and I looked into the water and saw that our opponents were not able to stick together and rise from the water. What those young men failed to realize that day is that I was not on the shoulders of an old man. I was on the shoulders of a giant. I'd like to read you some excerpts from The Flame Still Burns by T.F. Tenney, which tells the stories of some of the early pioneer preachers of Louisiana. I'm going to read you a few uh, excerpts from Persecution's chapter. Persecution and hardship were a part of the early Pentecostal story in Louisiana. Preachers preached despite rotten eggs and tomatoes thrown at them from somewhere outside the tent. Some were beaten. Others suffered verbal abuse. This persecution seemed to only spread the flame of revival, but William F. Haley pitched a tent in Provencal in 1917. Neighbors complained about the noise, imagine that. So the tent was moved to another location. After just a few weeks of services, the tent canvas was slashed and the ropes cut. A petition was circulated among the community to insist the preachers, Brother Haley and Brother Cook, get a job. Their intent was to silence the preachers and kill the revival. However, the preachers ignored the petition and continued preaching. Both preachers were arrested and taken to jail. The saints continued to gather at the tent for prayer service, even without a preacher. And somebody got the Holy Ghost there in those prayer services. The preachers eventually got out of jail, and the charges were dropped. Brother Yoakum's archives. We have witnessed much persecution. And remember, these are Louisiana stories. Many times, rocks bound down the aisle, bounced down the aisle and sometimes hit the Bible stand, but I kept preaching. They talked about us and tried to slander, but it didn't matter. God had his hand of blessing upon us. Sometimes buildings were burned by unbelievers in the communities where new churches were getting started. Brother Jimmy Wrinkle recalled leaving his newly acquired, borrowed church building in the Clarks community only to turn around and see it on fire. The church had been torched by someone pouring kerosene up and down the seats and then setting it on fire. This story is also told from that congregation. In 1931, Brother Dale from Provencal preached a revival with, for Brother Jesse King. Persecution began immediately. Brother King was walking home from the church one night with a lighted pine splinter for a lantern. Two young men threatened to whip him. He stopped, laid down his Bible, and said, Go ahead and get it over with. I got a lot to do. 
When the young man lifted up his arm to hit Brother King, he could not move it anymore. This shocked them, and they came to the meeting and got the Holy Ghost. One night while Brother King was praying at the altar with a seeker, someone threw acid on his back, and it burned the shirt off of his back, but it did not burn his skin. In the early 1950s, Brother David Eights and a group of workers pitched a tent in Natchitoches to begin the work there. There were complaints that the services were too loud. The group was officially asked to turn down their volume and cease disturbing the peace. Matters came to a peak when the sheriff and his deputies moved in on the worshipers, arrested many, kept them in jail overnight, and filed formal complaints. Among those jailed were Brother and Sister Eights, their evangelist Sister Nettie Kraut, and many others. The subsequent trial required courage and determination on the part of the congregation, but their case was won, and the church still stands in that fine city today. Brother W.E. Yoakum, we accepted trials as something to make us closer to God. I've had people threaten my life. They have called me at night wanting to challenge me to meet me somewhere, meet them somewhere so they could threaten me. We were persecuted for the gospel's sake. Brave soldiers of the cross have brought this gospel to us. What a heritage we have. Because of their sacrifices and because of their great faith, they also saw many miracles. This is a chapter from The Flame Still Burns on Miracles. I'm going to try to go through it fast. Early Pentecostal pioneers trusted God and learned to live by faith. This produced an age of miracles. An account told of Brothers Wiley and Hiram Holland and W.T. Hemphill in the 1930s exemplifies this trust and rewarded faith. The men had caravaned together to Tioga for a few days while waiting on the Lord for direction to begin another revival. For five days, bread and water is all they had to eat. As they knelt to pray the sixth morning, Brother Hemphill suggested they ask the Lord for a steak. When they got off their knees from praying, and they had been praying for quite a while, they looked up and saw a big German shepherd dog coming through the pines. He had a wrap package in his mouth. He brought it right over to him and dropped it. There were no teeth marks on the package. They opened it up, and there were some fresh cut steaks from a meat market. They could not believe their eyes, and they began to give thanks to God. In 1935, while preaching in Urania, a severe storm blew through. Brother and sister C.G. Weeks were at the home of the pastor there. Brother Weeks was in one room. Sister Weeks was in another room. He heard a loud clap of thunder and, and lightning dance across the floor. He went in there to check on his wife to find her lying lifeless on the floor. Her clothes had been burned and torn, and her shoes had literally been blown off of her feet. He knelt and prayed diligently, and God miraculously raised her from the dead. Brother Marvin Hester Sr., in his personal testimony recorded in the Louisiana District Archives, recalled that many miracles happened, and on a couple of occasions, the dead were actually raised. Pauline Wisby Smith, who is currently a member of the Walnut Hill United Pentecostal Church, fell dead during the course of a service at that church. Her mother recalls, There was no life in Polly's body whatsoever. The saints gathered around to pray, and finally Brother Dalton Owens persisted in prayer until the Lord raised her from the dead. It is reported that several people saw a person in shining apparel standing next to the preacher while he prayed for the sick in the church in De Quincey. Many people were on the outside of the building looking in and saw a great ball of fire going across the roof. They thought the church was on fire. Eventually they realized it was the Holy Ghost, and they came in and got the Holy Ghost. All Louisiana stories. The Pentecostal Faith, a newsletter published by T.W. Barnes in the early 1950s with a faith-building report of miraculous healings. In one issue, the following headlines are noted. High blood pressure gone. Arthritis completely gone. Cancer falls off. Healed of throat trouble. Rheumatism healed. There's another story of Brother Charlie McKithen. A lady came in on a wagon in a wheelchair. They prayed for her. She was instantly healed, left her wheelchair behind. Recently, someone discovered an old reel-to-reel -reel tape of Sister Maud LaFleur Wilkins, and I think we have some kin folks here. First recorded in 1976. My mother and I were visiting in a meeting in DeRitter with Methodists and Baptists, and maybe some Catholics were there. Everyone was supposed to say something, even if it was just quote a scripture. After my mother quoted a scripture, I got up and quoted one, and the power of God came all over me, and I went to speaking in tongues. They had never heard anything like that. After we were dismissed, a Methodist missionary preacher came over to me and said, where did you learn that Italian language? 
I said, I don't know any Italian language. He then said, I've been a missionary, and I can speak it well. You were talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and how you can get the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. Well, I answered, that was God speaking through me because I don't know one word of Italian. She went on to tell of how she preached to some uh, Mexican drunks in Spanish, even though she didn't know Spanish. She was also translated at least twice. She goes on to tell this story. Brother and Sister Dowden and I were waylaid one night on the way home from church in a Surrey, which is a two-seated horse-drawn buggy. We were holding a meeting four miles from Livingston, Texas. Some people got mad. They didn't like what we were preaching. So on this night, they waylaid us and, told, uh, and had told others they were going to kill Brother Dowden and beat me and Sister Dowden half to death. We didn't have a top on this buggy. Sister Dowden and I were sitting on the back seat with one of the little boys. Brother Dowden and two other boys were in the front seat. All of a sudden, the power came on me, came on me and I went to speaking in tongues. Sister Dowden said, oh, Sister Maud's going to be translated. So she caught hold of my dress, and she almost pulled it off. And she told her husband, I've got it. I have a grip on it. If she goes, I'm going to. I was standing up speaking in tongues, and all of a sudden, a light came from heaven. And I can't tell you how bright that light was. It enveloped the horses, all of us, just about the time we were passing that gang. And they were hiding in the trees, and they couldn't do a thing. That light followed us until after we got to the edge of town. We've been talking about some things that have happened in Louisiana. Let's bring it a little closer home. Our own brother J.A. Hawthorne sold all that he had except his truck and a few things to carry with him. He put a tarp over the back of his A model pickup for a camp and set out to evangelize. He endured hardships and saw many miracles. Once they were having revival services on the floor of a two-story building. The people didn't like what they were doing, so they started dancing really loud on that wood so they could try to distract the service. That didn't work, so they tried pouring hot water through the cracks in the floor to try to distract them. Brother Hawthorne was threatened to be hanged. His daughters had cocoa burrs rubbed in their long hair. He had rocks, green peaches, tomatoes, and eggs thrown at him during services. His family survived on minimal food at times, including one week where they had nothing but a half gallon of clabbered milk and a half gallon of partially ripened peaches and they often had to make do by putting cardboard in their shoes to make them last once he received a massive offering for the time of five dollars and a preacher borrowed it and never brought it back <laughs> they had it hard but they saw some amazing things sister mary hawthorne was instantaneously healed which caused many people to believe and be saved Brother Hawthorne's oldest son drank some poison and was in really bad shape, and God healed him. Brother Hawthorne saw a vision of a man in Chase, Louisiana, receiving the Holy Ghost, and God told him to go there. So he went there, and that man was the first person to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost when Brother Hawthorne laid his hands on him. Twice, Brother Hawthorne arrived in new towns, and God had already moved on someone to send money ahead to that town before God had even told Brother Hawthorne, where he was going. Once during a heavy rain, Brother Hawthorne prayed for his windshield wipers to work, even though they had never worked. He prayed for them, they worked, and they never worked again after that rainstorm. Through it all, Brother Hawthorne never wavered. He started churches, had mighty revivals where many received the Holy Ghost. He saw miracle signs and wonders. His perseverance is why we have what we have today. Let's talk about some other notable miracles that happened right here in this church as remembered by Lamar Johnson and documented by Liz Vickery. T.J. Hawthorne, son of Fred Hawthorne, was on a school bus that was involved in a serious accident. T.J. sustained injuries. In fact, both legs were broken, and T.J. was encased and cast on both legs. The church began earnest prayer for T.J. He was healed and began walking around on his legs without crutches. They cut the cast off of him, and he was completely healed from that day on. Sister Ollie Riley was sick unto death, as the Bible would say. The doctors told the family that she would be dead by 11 o'clock, but Jesus. The family called Pastor J.A. Hawthorne. When he got there, he reported that as he arrived, he saw an angel of God telling him that she would be okay. Naturally, the doctors were skeptical, but by 12 o'clock, she was sitting on the side of the bed drinking coffee. She lived for many years to tell her story of that night of divine intervention. Brother Albert Goodman 
was very sick with stomach ulcers. He could not hold down any food and was quickly losing weight. Pastor J.A. Hawthorne awoke early one morning, and the Lord spoke to him, saying, Go pray for Brother Albert Goodman. When Brother Hawthorne arrived there, just as the sun was rising and knocked on the door, the family was surprised to see him standing there. He laid his hands on Brother Albert Goodman. He was instantly healed. He ate a big breakfast that morning and never had another problem with his stomach. Brother Albert said, I could eat an onion as big as my fist, and it wouldn't hurt me. Brother Errol Ellerby was completely blind in one eye. He went up for prayer one night in a revival in about 1952. Brother Hawthorne and the evangelist prayed for him, and God instantly healed him. And many years later, he could still see clearly out of that eye. Time would fail me to tell of the many great saints that are going on before us from this church. H.B. Rollins, H.W. Armstrong, Fred Hawthorne, Sister Tarver, Henry Hawthorne, Grady Welch Sr., Brother Ellerby, Rowena Cruz, and Maggie Collins, whose famous line was, think about it. What? Maggie Rollins. That's not what I said. Oh, Maggie Rollins. Think about it. Those who have gone on before us and paved the way for us endured many hardships and saw many miracles. Indeed, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Young people, if you look around this room, you will find many modern-day living giants right here among us who have witnessed many hardships and seen many miracles in recent history. And I, for time, I won't tell you all about them, but I could. And I won't name any of their names except our senior pastor, Brother Floyd Hawthorne. He's taken on the mantle of his father, and he has carried the torch high for many, many years. Amen. Brother Hawthorne, we honor and respect you for the sacrifices that you've made to keep revival fires burning and this church alive and well. Truly, we stand on the shoulders of giants. The term standing on the shoulders of giants is first attributed to Bernard of Chartres and was popularized by Isaac Newton in 1675 when he said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. The expression is used to convey the point that we see more and farther than our predecessors, not because we have keener vision or greater height, but because we are lifted up and born aloft on their gigantic stature. Certainly, it is easy for us to look at the giants on whose shoulders we stand and feel a keen sense of awe and reverence. Certainly, we should. Let's talk about some of the other things that these giants did. They let anyone and everyone on the platform to sing. At times, most of the congregation would be on the platform. Where's that in the Bible? Besides, who were they singing to? If you say God, well, they could have done that from the pews. I think I know why they stopped that. I can hear it now. Can you believe that he got up there after what he said about my husband? And did you see what she had on of all the unmitigated gall? I'm going to talk to Brother Hawthorne. I told you this church was going charismatic. <laughs> they had victory marches. Yes, it's about like it sounds. Some sweet little old lady would get the spirit to moving on her, and boy, whoop, here she goes, she gone. And then there comes another one, and there they go. Before you know it, the whole church is marching around the church. Where is the apostolic pattern for that? I guess they were mimicking the children of Israel walking around Jericho, but certainly you can't find that in, in Acts. They had testimony service where practically everybody in the building 
would testify. I'm pretty sure I know why they quit that. (laughs) We laugh under our breath because they preached against television when the worst thing on television was Andy Griffith and Barney Five. We, you know, (laughs) them old timers. Yeah, they shouldn't have been preaching against technology. They should have been preaching against content. (laughs) We're, We're so enlightened now. We're so smart. Some preach against ladies wearing red because it was associated with harlots. Some wouldn't read the comics in the newspaper. It blows our mind that they would show up to a service or even a meeting and pick the preacher on the spot. It happened to Brother Floyd. He went to a preacher's conference. And he was asked to preach in the service. Oftentimes, song service consisted of simple requests from the audience for hymnals from the hymn book. Or, some sweet little sister would just holler out from the back, Hey, Betty Sue, can you sing Amazing Grace tonight? Well, I I didn't bring my, 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 my sheet music. I mean... Come on. You can't be any more organized than that. Don't knock their methods. You don't know the culture of the people they were trying to reach. Were they a little hard-nosed? Yes, they were. Their culture was hard. And besides, they never knew when they might get in in the nose with a tomato. If you would have come at their culture with this or lights or haze machines, you would have been irrelevant to their culture. Let's be honest. If you would have brought a set of drums in, you would have probably split the church. Don't bring that devil worship an instrument up in here. Did they have it all right? No. But we cannot relate to the culture of the people that they were trying to reach. So we should not criticize the methods, the methods that they used. Were their methods effective? Did they reach a lost and dying world? Yes. That's all that matters. Be very careful when you criticize or make fun of the giants on whose shoulders you stand. Because when you're standing on the shoulders of giants... You can see over some things that they cannot see over. You can see farther than they can see. But don't ever forget the reason why you can see as far as you can see. You're standing on the shoulders of giants. When you're standing on the shoulders of giants, you're a little farther away removed from all the mud and the dirt. Our church services aren't nearly as dirty and muddy as they used to be. As brush harbors, dirt floors, and flying tomatoes. Yeah, we've cleaned up real nice. But God help us if we ever forget the price that was paid by the pioneers of Pentecost. They trudged through a lot of literal and metaphorical mud to get us where we are today. And we are forever beholden unto them. For unto whom, Luke 12, 48. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. If you look at the parable of the talents, you know, certainly we don't know. Perhaps the man who was given the ten talents would have still been told, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, if he had brought eleven, or maybe even fifteen. But the pattern established by the parable of the talents is that the more you are given the more you are expected to return our forefathers through much pain and persistence peril and persecution prayer and passion have brought us to this place of prosperity we are the servants who were given ten what more could we possibly need to have in time revival 
My point tonight is simply this. God has used mighty men and women of God to equip us for this time. And as Brother Mark has been trying to drive home to us, the time is now for us to use what we have been equipped with to win the loss. God has orchestrated by grand design that we would have everything that we need to bring about the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. I agree with Kanye. I agree with Brother Mark. This last great awakening is here. And now is the time that we realize that everything we need is right in front of us. We have the tools. We have the talent. We have the treasure. Now it is time for us to put it to work. Brother J.A. Hawthorne, Brother Floyd Hawthorne, and many, many great saints of the Winsboro Church have given us a lot. Make no mistake, maintaining what they have given us is not success. Amen. The status quo is not victory. The giants got us here, but we are standing on their shoulders. We must supersede their accomplishments or we have failed. And I'm not talking about some silly numbers game where they had 200, we got to have 400. I'm talking about taking it to the next level. A lost and dying world depends on us to build on what they've given us and become the giants of our generation. We cannot simply raise our family in the church. For the great harvest to be accomplished, we must challenge ourselves to think beyond ourselves. We must not settle for selfish church that tickles our fancy but doesn't affect our world. Doing things because that's the way we've always done it or because that's the way we like it to be done has got to take a back seat to doing things that are effectual. Sometimes I'm afraid we get so caught up doing things that we like that we keep doing them even though they are not achieving our purpose. It's been said that if you fall in love with what you're doing, you'll keep doing it even when it doesn't work. We have to shift our focus from the inside to the outside. Amen. In Max Licato's book entitled, When Fishermen Don't Fish, he tells the story of a time when he went fishing with his dad and a friend. The weather became so bad that they were cooped up in their camper, unable to fish. As the tension and boredom mounted, the moose turned sour, and he began to notice several character flaws of his friend that he had never noticed before. Needless to say, they did not have a good trip. Max says that he learned a hard lesson that week, not about fishing, but about people. Here are the things that he says happen when men who are called to fish don't fish. When those who are called to fish don't fish, they fight. When energy intended to be used outside is used inside, the result is explosive. Instead of casting nets, they cast stones. Instead of help, extending helping hands, they point accusing fingers. Instead of being fishers of the lost, they become critics of the saved. Rather than helping the hurting, they hurt the helpers. As we take up the mantle of the giants who have gone on before us, we've got to be like Elisha. God give us a double portion. We do not want to be just equal to those who built the modern day church. We must, have, we must build on top of what they built to have the latter rain and the former rain together. We must add to the, their already great accomplishments. We must move the church higher. Plateauing to some lukewarm state of maintaining our current membership is not what God called us to do. I'm extraordinarily thankful for all of the growth that we've been having around here, all the new babies that have been born into the kingdom. This train is on the right track. But it's time to put more coal in the engine. It's time to stuff that engine full of coal and let's kindle a fire hot enough to propel us into perpetual revival. God help us if we don't take all that we've been given and invest it in the kingdom. We have not been given all of this so that we can have comfortable, selfish church. It would be a shame if we let church be about us. It's not about us. It's about the lost. It's about others. That's why Jesus left the 99 to get the one, because it's about the lost. Our forefathers did not suffer and sacrifice so that we could sit in an air-conditioned building on padded pews and enjoy our ride 
into glory land. God died for sinners. Yet we get so caught up in church for us that we don't want to lay down our preferences for sinners. Is church about us? Or is church about saving the lost? It's time we get back to our roots. Just like the apostolics in the book of Acts, just like the pioneers of modern day Pentecost, just like the pioneers who brought the gospel to Louisiana, just like our forefathers who built this church. Our focus, young people, and all of the young people, not everybody 70 and under, our focus must shift from what we have to what we have to do. We must be willing to make the sacrifices to reach our generation. They were willing to put it all on the line, to sell everything, to endure hardship, to do whatever it took so that others might be saved. Many of you may know Brother Bruce Howell. He's the general director of Global Missions. He used to be a missionary in El Salvador where he led one of the fastest growing works in the world. This was the first place where Brother Billy Cole was able to duplicate what happened on the day of Pentecost, where 3,000 received the Holy Ghost in one day. Brother Howell pastored one of the largest works there where many hundreds of people were in his church. If they showed up on Sunday morning and there were no guests, they dismissed service. He said, I'll give you an hour to go out and find some people and compel them to come in. And if they could find guests, they would have church. Why? Because church was not about them. It was about reaching the lost. We were not meant to be a memorial. We are meant to be on a mission. We need to get lost in the mission and the purpose of Calvary. We can't get so sentimental about the giants of our past that we aren't intentional about the purpose of Calvary. It's good to look in the rearview mirror, to learn from it, but you can't drive looking in the rearview mirror. We are not just a trophy of the giants on whose shoulders we stand. Young people, we've got to fight to win our own prize. Our greatest fear should not be failure, but succeeding at things that don't matter. We can have great singing, we can have great programs. We can have the best of everything, and we do. That's wonderful. But we were not called to have great singing. We were not called to have great programs. We were not called to have the best of everything if we are not winning the lost. Are those things great to have? Yes. But only in the context of winning our world. Now is the acceptable day. Now is the appointed time. We do not need anything else to be given to us to have end time revival. We have everything we need. We must make sure that our focus is not on maintaining what we've been given, like that wicked servant who was given the one talent. Our focus must be on investing ourselves to reap a mighty harvest like that servant who was given the ten talents. We have an absolutely wonderful church. And maybe I'm just a little bit prejudiced. But I happen to believe we have one of the best churches around here. The best church around here. Sorry, Facebook. But we, yeah, we cannot get so caught up in our greatness and lose our focus on the lost. We've got to capitalize on our greatness, on what we've been given, and use it to change our world. Giants, don't think we don't need you. The youth are the energy, but you are the wisdom and strength. We need you, giants, to be our mentors. Turn us loose, but guide us. Encourage us to try things to reach our culture, but pick us up when we don't get it just right. Just like our forefathers, just like you, not everything we try will work. Not all of our methods will be successful. Some of them may even be mocked by future generations. Sometimes we will find ourselves lying face down on the water and feeling very defeated. We don't need you casually observing or, God forbid, even scoffing from the edge of the pool. We need to feel the strength 
of your arms wrapped around us, those muscles that were hardened by years of sacrifice and labor to pick us up out of the water and encourage us to victory. If we, the younger generation, can remain firmly planted on the shoulders of these giants, we might do a little flailing around. We might look like some chickens every now and then. We might even fall flat on our faces. But I know the giants here, and they will pick us up. And together, we can win. Together with Christ, we can reach a lost and dying world. It is time. We do not have a single service to waste. As Brother Dean is fond of saying, we don't have throwaway services. We must be intentional in everything that we do. It's about reaching the lost. It's about end time revival. And the time is now. Please stand and let's, in closing, just talk to God and, com and say, God, we are willing, Lord, to commit everything that we have been given, God, by you and by these giants who have gone on before us, God. We long for your presence, God. Help us, O oh Lord God, not to waste, God, the talents that we've been given. Help us, God, to use them for your glory. Help us, O oh God, to use them, God, to win a lost and dying world. God, place a burden on our hearts, God, to win the lost, God. We need you, God, to help us, O oh Lord. We long for your presence, God. We long for a visitation of your power. Let your Shekinah glory, God, fill our house. Fill our hearts, God, with the burden for the lost. Help us, O oh God, to make any sacrifice. Help us, God, to make any sacrifice to win a lost and a dying world. We love the name of Jesus. We give you praise, honor, and glory. Blessed be the name of Jesus. God, we give you praise. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming tonight. God bless you. Do you have anything to say? Anything we need to... Announcements? Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.